For those of you who didn't watch my original, in fact, day one review of my Tuareg V10, I would urge you to check that one out as well, because in conjunction with this video, it gives you kind of an all-round look at what you can expect, the good points, maybe some of the not-so-good points, about Tuareg V10 ownership. Now, some of these things you could apply to more than just the V10. You could apply some to the V8 even, maybe even the ultra-rare W12, or even some of the regular Tuaregs as well. In particular though, of course, I'm talking the V10. Now my V10 in particular is the first generation. In fact, it's the last of the first generation, a late 2006 before it had the facelift with the larger chrome grill and the more curvy headlamps. There are more changes than just that, but that's the easy way to tell the difference. Now the mileage on it was 100,000 when I purchased the car. It has 110,000 now, after just over a year of ownership, so I haven't put a ridiculously high amount of miles on it, but the main reason for that, of course, is because I worked mostly on YouTube in that time, so my mileage wasn't as high as somebody who would be commuting every day. However, I've done a number, in fact quite a few, long mileage journeys. I'm talking anything from a few hundred miles to over five or six hundred miles in a single day. And of course, that's a fairly good way to gauge what the vehicle will be like on longer journeys if necessary. Now, first of all, let's talk running costs. And then after that, I'm going to talk about issues that I've had. Is the reliability good or not? That kind of stuff. So, first of all, running costs. The biggest one, of course, is going to be fuel. As with any vehicle, that's the most common thing that you're going to get. Unless, of course, you buy something like a Lancia, an Alfa Romeo, or a Maserati, then probably you're going to be paying even more on repairs than on fuel. But, in the case of the Touareg, it's actually a lot better than you'd think. In fact, one of my favourite things about the V10 is how good the fuel economy is. Specifically, though, in comparison to the type of vehicle which it is. Now, with the V10, most people tend to spit out the same facts over and over again. 5 litre, V10, twin turbo, 553 pound feet of torque, etc. Those things are all true, but chances are you already know those things as well. So there's not really a huge amount of merit to talk about them again, considering I covered a lot of that in my other review anyway. So, here's the stuff that you actually need to know when it comes to how surprisingly good it is to run. This thing weighs 2.7 tonnes. That is one of the heaviest vehicles on the road. Of course, not counting goods vehicles. 2.7 tons for a five-seater is ridiculously heavy. In fact, it's at least as heavy as the Audi Q7, and that is a bigger SUV. So, much like the Bentley Continental GT, it's a very densely packed vehicle. The reason why I'm mentioning that weight, though, is because of how well it performs, how well it handles itself, and crucially, how good this thing actually is for running costs. Now, a crucial thing to bear in mind, and if again you checked out my video regarding the 0-60 time on this, again, that's linked down below if you haven't watched it, I proved in that video that this particular Tuareg can hit 60 in 6.9 seconds. And the reason for that, because of course stock it's quoted at 7.8, is because it's remapped. Now that is crucial, not just for performance, but for fuel economy and running costs. I would strongly recommend getting your diesel remapped, V10 or otherwise. And the reasons why are pretty self-explanatory. You've got more horsepower, more torque, a better use of the rev range, especially when it comes to the torque in particular, to give you less throttle requirements and more performance and economy from said throttle. So in other words, you don't really even have to floor the car to get great performance out of it. Now in particular, the advantage in fuel economy is huge. The Touareg averages about 30 to the gallon. And that is from a lot of around town driving as well. So for a 5 litre twin turbo, nearly 3 ton SUV, to have that kind of economy, it's pretty remarkable. Especially when you bear in mind that this technology is now, what, 14 years old? Which is pretty crazy to think about. Now this one is running, I believe in the region of like 350 to 380 horsepower, something like 600 pound feet of torque, based on the research that I did online. So those are good numbers as well. As I said, it has been proven to do 0 to 60 in under seven seconds, so it certainly isn't slow. Top speed wise, you're looking at 140 at least, but crucially that fuel economy on the highway is actually up around 36. 36 to the gallon is insanely good. Now forget the fact that it nearly weighs three tons, just for a V10 engine car to be capable of that kind of economy is amazing. However, this is the kind of vehicle that much like a train, it loves to be moving at a high, 
steady, consistent pace, which is why it's so good on the highway. All of that rolling weight, all of that low end torque, you know, you're up at 65 miles an hour in sixth gear, barely turning at 1000 RPM, it loves that kind of thing. This is a fantastic motorway eater. This thing consumes long journeys, you get out the car as fresh as a daisy, you're never uncomfortable, it's fantastic for long distances. For commuting, perhaps not so much. Now for me, I use it for some commuting, for, as I said, longer distances, and for some shorter ones, but if you, for instance, live in the middle of a city, let's say, for example, London, it's probably not the car for you for a couple of reasons. One, it's massive. It's six foot three wide, which is as wide as I am tall. So although it's not the longest thing out there, it is very tall and very wide. It's kind of like this big chunky, you know, pit bull of a car. The second thing is the fuel economy drops like a stone around town. And the reason why is pretty obvious. Even with a massive amount of torque, it takes a lot of juice to get a nearly three ton vehicle moving, especially when it's driving all four wheels all the time, as this one is. The third reason is because of emissions tax. If I recall correctly, I think the Touareg V10 is the second most polluting car on UK roads. And of course, diesels didn't turn out to be the earth-saving you know, alternative tech and fuel that we were promised, and they certainly haven't turned out cheaper either, but that's not the reason why I love them. I actually love diesel performance cars, not because of their you know, environmental emissions, but because of two things in particular. One is effortless performance. And trust me, you might think you've driven a fast petrol car before that has just lazy power. You haven't. You haven't driven a lazy performance car until you've tried a diesel, because it really is literally effortless. Hill starts in the Tuareg V10, you may as well be on a flat road. It doesn't even notice hills. This thing can literally tow a Boeing 747, as they proved on fifth gear. In fact, they had to make the car heavier to get enough grip to pull it. So it was five tons heavier, even without the Boeing on the back. So in terms of pulling power, a caravan is nothing for this kind of car. Now, what I will say when you're looking to buy one, I would actually recommend buying one that does not have a tow hook. Now, of course, the owner could just remove it, so check to see if there ever has been one, but a tow hook is not so much a bad sign, it's more a sign that the car has had a, a history of working for its living, if you will. To me, if you can find one that hasn't had to do that, it, it's only a better thing. You know, if you get some massive bodybuilder, it's not that he can't lift hundreds of kilos, but you wouldn't ask him to do that all day long. Likewise with this engine, yes, it can do it, but of course it's going to put more strain on the engine over years and years of use, especially once you get up into six-figure mileage. Now, in terms of those fuel costs, as I said, you're looking at 60 or 63 would be nice, 36 even to the gallon, but the reason why 63 came to my mind is because it costs you about £100, I believe just over, but it depends where you fill up, to fill this car's tank. It's, if I recall correctly, a 100 litre diesel tank. So it's about £85 plus VAT, really, rounding it off to about £100 to fill up the car. That will get you, if you do mostly motorway miles, at, in my experience, 65 miles an hour, because that seems to be the optimum area for this particular vehicle, you can get over 630 miles out of a tank. I've done that multiple times. So if you think of it that way, that's actually pretty phenomenal. And for an example of how good that is, compare it to technically the ultimate Tuareg, the one which I would actually love to own as well, the ultra rare W12. That is a six liter naturally aspirated 12 cylinder model. They only built 500 of them. It's an absolute beast. Of course, it's a fantastic car in its own way. The problem is because it's a petrol primarily, it uses way more fuel. That W12, struggles to hit 300 miles to a tank of petrol. That is worse than my Maserati was. This is over 600 miles to a tank of diesel, and the tanks, if I recall correctly, are about the same size. So it's a huge difference, like literally double the range. Around town, though, you will not get 600 miles to the tank, which is why I said this is much more of the kind of vehicle that you want if you're doing longer journeys, and especially if you live in more rural areas with stuff like A roads and B roads, rather than 90 degree city corners every time, you know, start stop traffic. This car hates that kind of stuff. You will drop to about probably 15 to 20 to the gallon around town. 
So as long as you keep the journeys varied, you'll still have great fuel range, and if you do motorway miles, that is when it's fantastic. It's built for that kind of thing, you can tell it eats it up. As I said, you barely even get above like 1100 RPM on the motorway anyway, so it's fantastic for that. In terms of other costs, I've had it serviced once in that time, and this is another crucial thing that you need to A, keep an eye on, but also B, that I personally love about the Touareg. See, the Touareg uses a similar method of being a high-performance car to what the Japanese like to do. Most Japanese legendary cars were not purpose-built for performance. Some of them are, like the NSX, but a lot of them, like the Evo, the Subaru WRX, even the Nissan Skyline, they actually come from more humble beginnings. They were not performance cars originally, and the advantage of that is you have all of this infrastructure before you turn it into a performance car. So the parts are much easier to find, they're not as expensive. So for example, when I serviced my Touareg in the past year, I changed all four brake discs, 330 millimeter discs on the back, 350 on the front, that's borderline like Ferrari F50 style discs, which alone on my Maserati for instance would be crazy expensive, all of the pads, a full something like nine liters of oil, you know, Castrol high performance oil change plus the filter, all of that, which Volkswagen incidentally wanted 1500 pounds for, I had it done independently after buying all of the parts myself for under 600. 600 pounds for four brand new discs, eight brand new pads, a new bulb which the car needed, a full new oil change and a new filter plus all of the fitting, for under 600, that is crazy good value. Now, of course, if something breaks, it could be more expensive. But, in my experience, the engine has actually been the best thing about this car. Now, you will hear horror stories, and some of them are true. You know, if the timing chain breaks, it's a full engine out job, it's about three and a half thousand pounds, that may well be true. I haven't had to do that, though. In fact, the engine has never skipped a beat. And for full exposure of the long-term experience that you can expect with a car like this, or at least my experience, of course, I'm going to tell you about four things, four issues, if you will, that this car either has or had. But the interesting thing is, there's a recurring theme here, and it's something which I've mentioned in my review of the Rolls-Royce that I did on the channel recently, and a couple of other cars as well. In fact, to some degree, this advice applies to all performance cars, so stick around for that. First thing was, Day one, the car broke down. Now, it didn't break down in the sense that it couldn't drive. As I mentioned in my review, I went from loving the car to hating it within the first day because the air suspension completely broke. It dumped all of the air out of the system and it had to have a new pump and new lines. Now, the silver lining of that was that the guy who sold it to me, who I believe was a fairly disingenuous guy in some other ways, actually promised, and I don't think he planned to, to have to fulfill this promise, but he did, to cover anything if it broke. Well, it broke day one, so he had to cover that. Now, one thing led to another, and because of the fact that he was trying to get mate's rates from the garage that he took the car to, it took 40 days to get it done. 40 days just for a new air pump and new lines. Now, that is ridiculous, and I could do a full episode about how ridiculous that time was, but long story short, it got fixed, and the reason why I don't count that as the car's fault is because, let's be honest, that had nothing to do with the V10 engine. Literally any car with air suspension can break. In fact, even a car without air suspension can have a problem there with dampers, with springs, with just rust in a wheel well, for instance, which can begin to affect the suspension. So that is not, in my opinion, a V10 trait. That's something which could have happened to any car. So I don't count that as a V10 issue. It is something that happened though, which is why I'm talking about it. The next problem arose, and this is one of the reasons why I don't trust the guy who sold it to me that much, or at least somebody in the past of the vehicle, when it came out of the garage after those 40 days, there was a notable kind of scratching on both of the front quarter panels, on the top in particular, where it was flush with the bonnet. That was not there when I first bought the car. Now, he may have just hidden it with wax or with, you know, some form of covering. And it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case, but it looked to me like the guys in the garage had been careless around the car. Maybe resting tools on the bonnet, leaning over it with zips on their clothes, scratching up the bodywork. I didn't pursue it at the time because I was glad to get the car back and it was my first car. So, of course, I was still fairly inexperienced at the time. I didn't really want to rock the boat 
Now, I also happen to know that this particular dealership did not even do their MOT correctly. Now, they wouldn't know that I knew this because unbeknownst to them, I am a mechanic. So I know how to do an MOT, I know how it's supposed to be done, and they actually gave it a pass before changing its air suspension and lines. That's not legal. You shouldn't do that. Again, I didn't pursue it. I decided to keep that piece of information if I needed to hold it over them, but I never did again, so I just moved on with my life. But, in terms of this bodywork, I recently took it, because yes, I'm a procrastinator, especially when it comes to something cosmetic, because it doesn't affect the car's performance at all, there's no rust issues there, etc. But I did take it to a paint shop. Two, in fact. The first guy said he thought it was a chemical spill, but he wasn't a, a super specialist on large areas, he was more like small touch-up stuff. Then I took it to a full-on, you know, spray booth place. They said that they thought it was sub-quality lacquer because it was the lacquer that was peeling in particular. Now, they wanted nearly a thousand pounds to repaint it. Again, that's not a Touareg V10 thing, that's just because painting cars is very expensive, and it's gonna be for any vehicle, really. Of course, more fancy colors, metallic stuff, all that kind of stuff changes the price, but that is how much they wanted. And for the price that I paid for the car to begin with, paying a thousand pounds just for two panels to be painted is simply not worth it to me. Now if it gets to the point where I have to do it, I will figure something out, but for the moment it's not a huge issue to me, because it is cosmetic. The third thing is, and this one is more so a, kind of a breakdown you could say, but I'll explain it and you'll see why I say that. When I reviewed the Aston Martin Vanquish on the channel not that long ago from Primoris 4x4, I of course took the Touareg. I drove the Vanquish, it was a great time, the video's on the channel, but then when I tried to start the Touareg, when you get into the Touareg V10, and I'm sure this is the same on other Touaregs as well, both newer and older, the dashboard begins to light up a little bit, gives you some information, it detects that the key is in the car, etc. It has keyless start anyway, so you just push a button. So. The car looked normal, nothing special. I pressed the start button, the lights went off of the dash, and it just went dead. No starter motor, no juice, nothing. Just completely dead. I thought, well, great. This clearly seems like a battery issue, but I don't have the tools here to start stripping down the car, especially something like a Touareg V10. So I said to the guys at Primoris, could you help me out with some jumper cables or with a power pack? They unfortunately didn't have a power pack at the time, but they did very kindly hook up one of their Range Rovers to the Touareg to try and jump start it. And it was pretty funny because it didn't work, but the amount of juice that that V10 engine needed to try and start literally caused the jumper cables to twist. They were dancing up and down in the air and twisting around from the juice drain on that Range Rover, which was fun and cool to boast about, but it didn't get the job done. But I then ended up calling out a official repair van in association with my insurance. They came over, the guy had a look at the battery, had a look at the terminals under the bonnet, because for those who don't know, the battery is actually located under the passenger seat. He moved the seat, and then he gave me this funny look. Because I was the other side of the car, I couldn't see the battery, and as soon as he looked at it, he looked up at me with this kind of smirk on his face. And he said, well, I can see the problem. The terminal isn't attached. One of the terminals on the battery was not attached to the battery at all. Now, you've got to bear in mind, I've been driving this Touareg for a year at that point, or close enough. I was like two weeks away from a full year of insurance. And when on earth has this had the chance to happen? Clearly somewhere along the road, and there's only a limited amount of times where it could have happened. It had to be the servicing garage, more likely the idiots who replaced the suspension, because they were consistently stupid with everything they did, from the MOT to the time it took, etc. Somebody did not put the battery back in correctly, did not tighten it up even correctly. And also, from what this technician said, the battery was just moving around freely under the seat. It was in this kind of tray, but there was no padding around it, so it was just shifting around. And on the way to Primoris, it's a fairly hilly road. So I guess after a year of driving, with accelerating, braking, turning, going up and down over bumps, it had worked itself loose. Now that should have never been able to happen. So at some point, some idiot didn't put the battery in properly and didn't secure it. But long story short, he reconnected the terminal and the car just drove again. So that was great. And again, I don't even count that as a breakdown because that is literally not the car's fault. There was no fault with the vehicle whatsoever. That was some absolute inept dimwit of a mechanic who did that. 
So once again, it's not really anything that you can attribute to a V10, I'm just telling you these are the things that happened. Now a secondary thing which happened is actually, I believe, to do with that, because every so often the Tuareg will have its alarm go off in the middle of the night for no apparent reason. And I believe it was to do with this battery, because with that terminal not having the correct connection, which had probably been happening for some time where it was loose and maybe getting half a connection and not a full one, it probably kept resetting the battery. And that, I believe, was probably affecting the alarm. Because once he reconnected that, it stopped happening. So it seems to me to be connected. So all in all, apart from the existing lack of peel issues on the bodywork, nothing else has been serious with the Tuareg. Now, that is once again on a car that has never towed anything, to my knowledge. It is remapped, it's had a couple of previous owners, and it has done six-figure mileage, now 110,000. That is pretty significant. It's had a good life, but still a lot of miles have been done in it, and I've had no engine issues, no significant mechanical issues of any kind, in fact, and even those smaller issues that I had were, you know, the air suspension or battery-related. Now, of course, that's not to say that a Tuareg V10 can't break. Any vehicle can break. A car can break as soon as it drives off the forecourt. Just ask any McLaren technician. However, when it comes to this car, I will say that most of those horror stories, and most of the people who tried to dissuade me from getting one, was simply wrong. I've had no engine issues whatsoever, and of course, something could break down tomorrow. You can never predict that, but so far, it's had over a year in my care, and what, 13 previous years in somebody else's care, of doing a pretty damn good job. So in terms of running costs, much like I said about the Japanese vehicles, it has that huge advantage. The Tuareg V10 is not a ground-up vehicle. It's a Tuareg with a V10 fitted. So as I said, it was already a normal car with high production numbers that just has a high performance engine put in there. It wasn't designed to be a V10 from day one. That's a huge advantage when it comes to costs because so many of the parts on this car are not just manufactured for the V10, which means that you don't have to pay anywhere near the kind of crazy prices that you would think you would. In fact, most of the time when you will have to pay higher is if something specifically goes wrong with that V10 engine. But even then, it's such a highly sought after car that you'll still get a decent amount of cash back from it, from people who want to break it. I know a lot of people who have mentioned that they have Tuaregs, they have second Tuaregs to break for parts when they need them, or just because they love them so much. And I can totally understand that. In fact, in my position, I'm seriously thinking about getting the Tuareg W12 as well as my V10. So I have one that's more practical, better fuel, more of a daily driver, and one that's just the nutty, over-the-top fun version. Now there is of course another notable running cost for many high-performance cars, all-wheel drive or otherwise, and that is tyres. So what is the Tuareg like on tyres? I mean, it's obscenely heavy, it's big, it's all-wheel drive, and it's got a massive amount of torque, so surely it eats tyres for breakfast. Well actually, no it doesn't. The back tyres look as good now as they did when I bought it, and that's after doing some 0-60 runs and 10,000 miles of driving, but the front ones in particular, interestingly, seem to be what wears out quicker. The outer edges of those tyres, to be specific, seem to wear out a little bit more rapidly, and if you think about it, that makes sense, because yes, it's not far off a 50-50 weight, but it's got a lot of engine weight over those front wheels, and the front wheels are doing so much more than the back, because even though it's all-wheel drive, the front wheels are supporting the weight of the engine, they're turning, and they're delivering torque and power to the road. So they've got a lot of jobs to do, so you can kind of forgive them for wearing the outer rubber a little bit more rapidly. And of course, that depends how you drive as well. If you drive it sensibly, of course, they'll last pretty well, as mine have. I like to throw it into a corner occasionally, but again, there's only so many places you can do that in the UK. It's six foot three wide, three tons, pretty tall, so of course throwing it through a corner has to be a pretty deliberate thing. Don't just do it haphazardly, <laughs> because it does have some understeer. In terms of using it as a daily driver, well, I think I've proven from this discussion, of course you can. If you have any outstanding questions about the car that you'd like to know, drop them down below. And incidentally, the one pretty expensive yearly thing that you will have to pay on this car is of course the tax. As I said, it is one of the most polluting vehicles on the road. Of course, they're technically trying to get stuff like this off the road eventually, 
but not for the moment, I'm still running mine. The Audi Q7 V12 will f have a similar fate, probably eventually, but I'd still love one of those. So the tax is pretty high. It's 580 pounds for this year's insurance, which if you compare that to, again, the six liter W12 version, that's about 340 pounds, because as crazy and as fast as it is, it's a petrol. So it actually puts out less harmful emissions than this one. So again, you have to bear that in mind, but if you think of it this way, 580 is more to tax, but you're getting double the fuel economy from every tank of fuel. So it pays for itself many times over in comparison to something like that W12. If you're in the market to use a V10 every day, it can absolutely do that. If you want it as a pure performance car, well, it is very big, very heavy, and very practical. So there are certainly easier, lighter, and quicker ways to get something like a track day toy. But if you are like me and love some undervalued, kind of understated, almost unicorn level performance from a car that's endlessly spacious, can fit basically anything I want to in the back with the fully flat foldable rear seats. I've taken hundreds of kilos of metal to the scrap yard as I've been clearing out the garden, all that kind of stuff. It's great. It does everything you need it to. So ultimately, that's it for my very in-depth, long-term review as an owner of a Touareg V10. Of course, give me your thoughts down below. As I said, be sure to check out my day one review to compare my thoughts then to my thoughts now. And if you haven't checked out my 0-60 runs to see how quick it was, it's actually pretty impressive to see the launch of this thing, so check out that video as well. Plus, of course, stick around on the channel, because in the future I will be driving more Touareg-related things, possibly an R50 here, a W12 over there, and hopefully getting my hands on a W12 at some point as well. But until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.